Welcome in to the 14. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We've got a three-man virtual booth, so to speak, today. Barry Allen joins us. Of course, Blake Lovell aside me here, as he always is. Let's start with you, Blake. Some basketball news and notes to wrap up as we go to a dual show today. We'll talk baseball and basketball. But a few guys have hit the transfer portal. Maybe a few other things of note around SEC tournament matchups, particularly with Oklahoma, Missouri. Let's start with that one. Uh, Oklahoma, it appears, is going to be without a key player against the Tigers yep. this week. Davion Harmon out for Oklahoma, and that is uh, significant as uh, he is their second leading scorer um, and just someone that really – you know, kind of fuels the the perimeter play, the backcourt play for them. Um, you know, I think really he's he's scored in double figures a lot this year. And down the stretch, he's had some really good games. Um, so not having him is significant. I would probably, we made our picks on the uh, Wednesday episode of the podcast. I would swing my pick now back towards Missouri without Davion Harmon uh, in the lineup for Oklahoma. Um, although, as we've seen before, if we go back to that game uh, with Alabama and Oklahoma, I think back to that one. Uh, where, you know, I think Oklahoma didn't have Austin Reeves in that game, and yet they still managed to find a way to beat Alabama. Um, So you never know with Lon Kruger's group. Uh, I think it'll still be a close game, but uh, that is a significant uh, roster uh, move there in terms of uh, not having Harmon on the floor uh, for Oklahoma. Well, that's also moved the line a point. Yeah, which makes sense. And like I said, I, I would swing it. I would swing it in Missouri's favor now because not only do they not have their second best player, but um, you know they're still a team too that's lost five of six. I think I said four or five actually yesterday. It's five of six um, entering this tournament, and uh, I just think that you know Missouri will be able to do some different things and be able to defend. I think in a couple different ways now, knowing that you don't have to you know put your focus on him. Um, so I think that's a that's a pretty significant um, you know development there. And and obviously you talked about the transfer portal. There's a lot uh, in the transfer portal now. Uh, I think the total number, if you look at verbal commits, 608 players are transferring uh, at this point. And just think, the season's not even over yet. Um, so we've had 608 uh, transfers uh, in 2021 to this point. SEC-wise, uh, Vanderbilt, of course, uh, lost several. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily a huge surprise. I don't think any of these overall are going to be a huge surprise because – uh, we've got to remember, I think players are going to be able to take advantage of sort of the transfer rules and the, the different nature of them now. Um, you know, as we said, Vanderbilt's lost, lost several. Max Evans, DJ Harvey, Cleavon Brown yesterday. Um, Auburn with Jamal Johnson. That was one that probably surprised me a little bit uh, in terms of him because he he played a key role for Auburn a bit down the stretch. Uh, Ole Miss, K.J. Buffin, that's another one. Uh, he was the big, you know, reason that they beat Kentucky late in the season. Uh, he had some good games, but he also, you know, at times could, could be a little bit up and down in terms of uh, production and that kind of stuff. So I don't really know that that one overall was a shocker to me either. Um, and then this morning, as we're talking here on Thursday, J.J. Chandler, Texas A&M, he's another one that's transferred. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, this is what we expect now. You're going to see transfers everywhere. I'd be surprised if there's a, a single team that doesn't lose a guy to at least transfer. Um, maybe there's a couple, but uh, that's just kind of the nature of the transfer rule. And uh, there are players uh, certainly trying to, to find ways to, to take advantage of that. So. Blake, um, Oklahoma got a lot of depth on that roster. Back to Missouri for a minute. And I think, was it Austin Reeves that missed the Alabama game? Yeah, it was Reeves, yep. And he's their leading scorer. So I guess a little counterpoint on that is Oklahoma has been in this spot before and dealt with it pretty well. And again, it's not a shallow bench. So that sort of mitigates the loss a little bit, I think. I think the difference for me is that at that time, Oklahoma was playing a whole lot better than they're playing right now. Um, they had, I mean, they were on a roll at that point. Remember, they had just come off beating Kansas, Texas. Um, they they were playing really well at that point. Now, I think you look at it, and it, it's almost like it's a little bit different because I don't know that they're playing as well as they were during that stretch when they did it before. But look, as we said, the reason why we picked Oklahoma, we thought that they, these teams matched up pretty similarly. But the reason we picked Oklahoma is because they had Lon Kruger. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm still going to look at it and say, if there's any guy that's going to have a chance to have his guys ready, even without one of their key players, uh, it's going to be him. And so I'm very fascinated to see how that plays out. I mean, it's the same with Georgia Tech and Loyola Chicago now uh, when you look at it in terms of, you know, I mean, Moses Wright, the ACC player of the year is out for Georgia Tech. All of a sudden, I think you'll see a lot of people swing that in Loyola's favor. But 
I, I'm always curious to see, you know, when you have these kind of, you know, which again, this season's very unique, but, um, you know, not having a key guy for a tournament game. Sometimes you're just able to see your team step up um, around that and be able to, to still find a way to win. But I think it, it makes it a little bit tougher now uh, for Oklahoma. Anything else noteworthy that you've seen going into the tournament that, that's maybe affected the way that you look at it a bit? Well, I mean, I think overall, the the more I think about some of these games, you know, we talked a lot about the SEC games yesterday. Um, we talked specifically about the first round matchups. There's one thing I will say, if we look a little bit forward, which I think we're going to do on Friday's episode of the podcast, we're going to make our picks and such for the tournament. Uh, but I, at first, initially, I said I liked Alabama's path. I really thought it was good. But I'm telling you, if UConn beats Maryland, that's a tough matchup for Alabama as a number seven seed UConn. That worries me a little bit. And the more I look at the matchup, it worries me even more. Um, so the Alabama fans listening now probably not going to be very thrilled at that. But I just think UConn as a seven is a is a dangerous seven seed. Um, and that that is something I look ahead to and wonder – if we get that matchup, you know, I feel like there are some things UConn will be able to do to really kind of counteract some of the things that Alabama can do. Um, so that's something that, that I, that I kind of look at overall. Um, if you look at sort of the rest, um, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily love anyone's path overall in the SEC. I, I still think Alabama has a chance to get to the Final Four, um, and, and I'm not going to sort of back off that just yet, but I think you would probably – want to have a scenario where you play Maryland instead of UConn. I think that's a much better matchup for Alabama. Arkansas's path, I'm starting to look at. I actually start to like the Hogs' path a little bit better maybe than anyone else uh, because I, I think, as we talked about with Colgate, I think they should be able to take care of business against Colgate. That Texas Tech team is not the Texas Tech of a couple years ago. And then beyond that, I think you've got some chances for some upsets. Um, I know a lot of people, and, and you know, the more I study the matchup, Arkansas, Ohio State would probably be the one that most people would project at that point. But there are a lot of people that are starting to jump on this Oral Roberts over Ohio State bandwagon. Um, and I don't know that that's completely out of the question when you start to actually look at the matchup and the numbers. Oral Roberts can shoot it. They're a very good free throw shooting team. Um, and there are a lot of different things that they can do well, I think, to be able to potentially match up with Ohio State. Um, so that that one's a little more interesting to me uh, that maybe than meets the eye, which guess what, guys? That potentially sets up, uh, if in the right scenario, an Arkansas-Florida Sweet 16 matchups. Uh, so, hey, maybe that's something we get an all-SEC in the Sweet 16 there, unsurprisingly. So, Well, we said we'd wrap up loose ends on Florida. I've slept on that. I still don't feel great, but I think I'm going to go Gators just because we've seen Trey Mann kind of take games over. I, I read this this morning. This is hard to believe. I think they said he had the chance to be the first player in Florida history with five straight 20-point games. Uh, that doesn't sound right to me for a, a program that had Vernon Maxwell, but if that's right, that's crazy. But anyway, the, the point I was getting at is that sometimes in March you look at superstars who can carry a team, and I think he's a guy that's capable of doing that. Yeah, I think so too. And for me, it's it's always about what is Florida going to get around him. That's that's the discussion for me is and just trying to to figure it out in terms of you know how is that going to affect Florida? Like, are the other guys going to be able to play to their capability? Um, that's what I always wonder about because we know like Colin Castleton, guys like that, Anthony DeRuji, Tyree Appleby. And we know they're able to get to step up in some of these spots, but I still just, you know, I don't know. Like I, I'm actually still maybe leaning towards Virginia tech. I don't love the pick, but I just think this is the definition of a toss up here. I just don't know which team that you're going to feel confident enough to kind of favor in this game. Um, I don't love the way Virginia tech's played down the stretch at all. Uh, but I just have been so up and down on Florida and I don't know why I just can't sort of shake that feeling that this Florida team sometimes you just don't know what you're getting. Um, but I, I don't know. I think this is a, it's going to be a good game. Probably one of the closest games of the first round would be my guess. Uh, but yes, Trey man is good enough to kind of put them on his back and, and will them to a win here. Uh, I just, I don't know. This is a, this is a tough one to call. Yeah. I have opinions on the bracket cause you got to make a pick, but then you look at some of these and I'm picking a lot of teams to win that you look at Ken Palm or, or two and three point favorites. I mean, really from, from the 412 games down, these are pretty competitive. And I'm even looking at Arkansas and Ken Palm. 
he's got Arkansas beating Colgate 83-75. That's not exactly a runaway. So I think this has got a chance to be a fun tournament, as most of them are, because a lot of these matchups, we're making our picks and we're stating our reasons, but it could easily go the other way. You know, a missed free throw, a cold snap here or there, and a lot of these games that we've kind of, I would say, got our mind made up on because you have to make a decision on games. But a lot of these, I make my pick with some level of confidence, but you look at them closer, and I, I could easily walk a lot of these back and tell you why. I just think that's going to make for a really fun tournament. Yep, I agree. I think when we – maybe if we make our some of our picks uh, on Friday's episode, I've got some uh, pretty wild picks, I'll tell you that, in terms of uh, – so not necessarily the Final Four, but uh, I've got some wild picks uh, in terms of the, the Elite Eight. I've, I've got a few uh, lower seeds there somehow. So uh, that's just – that's the nature of trying to figure out how this tournament's going to play out. Like we said, we could sit here and break down – the matchup for every SEC team all day long. Uh, but once that game actually starts and you start to kind of sense how the game's playing out, um, things can go in the different direction in a hurry. So uh, I'm very curious. I think there's a lot, as we said yesterday, I think there's a lot of good matchups for SEC teams. I still think, you know, LSU St. Bonaventure is the one that I, I look at the most as the most intriguing. Uh, but uh, there, there, there could be a lot of good games in this first round. Barry, we're fired up for basketball up here in Nashville. How are folks in Tuscaloosa feeling about this tournament? Well, they're really excited. I mean, there's a lot of people think they have a legitimate chance to go to the Final Four. I mean, you know, they're in a, you know, if they can, you know, get through that UConn Maryland second game, I don't think they'll have any issues with Iona in game one. Uh, but if they can get through that, uh, you know, that second game, and I think UConn will be a harder task for them than Maryland, although Maryland has Galen Smith on their roster as a former Crimson Tide player. So he'll certainly have some incentive if he were to run into Alabama and some of his old teammates in the second round. But I think a lot of people in Tuscaloosa are really excited about Nate Oates and Alabama basketball and the prospects of being in the Final Four for the first time ever. Uh, NATO's got a text from a certain coach in the league, which was pretty interesting. Yeah, he really did. It was, uh, he mentioned it yesterday. Uh, John Calipari texted him. Uh, and I think they later talked, but he just texted him. He told him, he said, don't change anything. Just do what you do. And, and that was kind of like, you know, kind of his way of saying, you know, you got a really good team. You're loaded. You can win. You can beat anybody. Just do what you do and, and, and stick with it. You've got a great plan and stick with it. And uh, I think it's pretty cool, you know, you know, guy that's won national championships at, at, at other places and is, you know, is, you know, certainly highly regarded as a coach and a recruiter in college basketball, you know, reaches out and, and lets him, you know, just, you know, you got this and, and don't, don't change anything. And I think that's probably good advice, you know, for that because uh, they do have a good plan and, and, and they need to stick to it and, and get after it. Yeah, I think they'll get Bruner back. Um, they're looking like they'll get him back this week, and uh, so they've got a good plan, and they, and it and it's worked to a 16 and two SEC regular season and a 19 and two overall SEC record, and they and a conference championship and a tournament championship. So I think that's solid advice. Just go do what you do and 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 play your best. Well, Barry, SEC baseball starts this week. That this weekend, it seems like it is on us in a hurry we've got some interesting series coming up this weekend i think the one that intrigues us both the most probably texas a&m going to florida because i think both those teams since the season started and a&m had a rough first weekend but it's been lights out since then and meanwhile we've i don't think quite seen well not quite we haven't seen the florida we thought we would see i think to me when i look at the six or, or seven series this weekend, I think that one is probably the most interesting, and I think you agree with me here. Yeah, I do. Um, A&M's playing lights out. They won uh, 11 in a row. They started 1-3. and three. They're 14-1 and one in the last 15 with that 11-game winning streak. And, yeah, they're doing it with pitching. They lead the league in strikeouts. But, you know, lo and behold, you look, and all of a sudden, Will Frizzell, their left fielder, has got seven home runs. He's tied for – third in the league in home runs now. So he, you know, they've done it in a lot of ways I and mean, they've had two 20 run games and I'll be that against, you know, Prairie View A&M and Samford, but yeah, he still scored 20 runs. And, uh, you know, you kind of look at Florida and they're just kind of scuffling. Uh, you know, they looked 
I mean, I saw the game Tuesday night at Florida State. They looked awful. I mean, they really did. Um, they didn't hit. They struck out 16 times. Uh, the three games where they've had 10 or more strikeouts on offense this year, they've lost every game. And they didn't have a hit till the fifth inning. And it just they, – they've, they've really struggled. And, and I know they use their midweek guys, but, you know, Florida State threw a freshman who, you know, would have been a high pick in the draft had there been more than five rounds and they were able to get uh, Montgomery to campus. And he takes a no-hitter into the fifth and strikes out nine. And, uh, you know, Mike Martin Jr.'s son, you know, hits two home runs in the game. And all of a sudden, you know, Gators find themselves in a huge hole and they couldn't climb out of it. And they, they have scuffled those in midweeks. And, and on the weekends, they lost to Jacksonville last week on a Friday night. They blew two leads against Miami opening weekend. Uh, almost blew a third one. And uh, so they have not lived up to the preseason number one billing that we saw from the Gators. And, that's why they've been replaced by Ole Miss and since by Florida, you know, at the top spot in the league. So a crucial series at home for Florida, and a you know, big series for Texas A&M, who ventures outside of the state of Texas today for the first time ever. They, they've played at Round Rock and all the other games have either been in Houston or College Station. So they, they've they'll they'll be out of the state of Texas this weekend for the first time. So let's see how they respond to that as well. You're going with the Aggies this weekend, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, I like them. I really like their team. I like their pitching. I like Miller. I like Josiak out of the pen. I like uh, Jonathan Childress on Sunday. I think uh, I think they have a really uh, a really legitimate chance. Uh, looks like the ballpark at uh, Florida plays small. There've been some, a lot of home runs hit there. I like A and M's power. I just like their balance up and down the lineup. And uh, you know, Florida's got to get going on offense. And, and we'll see how Mace and and uh, uh, the other guy totally lost the middle guy's name. Leftwich. Leftwich. There we go. I wanted to call him Lighter, but Vanderbilt's got him. Uh, Jack Leftwich and then uh, and Bart and Barco on Sunday, and just kind of see how they go uh, this weekend against the Aggies. But yeah, I, I, I'm kind of leaning towards the Aggies right now. You know, the other series I think after that is maybe the most interesting, and this will probably surprise some people. Tennessee at Georgia. Georgia's pitching has been tremendous. I think the hitting is an issue, but we kind of suspected that going into the season. Tennessee has had a really good start here. 15 and 3, 11 in the RPI. It lost back-to-back games against Indiana State, both two-run games back on February the 27th, but recovered to sweep Georgia State last weekend or two weekends ago. Took 3 at UNC Greensboro, which is a pretty decent program. Um, you know, BTTSU in the midweek. Tennessee's pitching, like I said to me, that was one of the questions. They had a lot of veteran arms. I wasn't sure how talented they are, but they pitched really well. Georgia has pitched well, which isn't a surprise. And I don't think Tennessee's offense has been quite what I thought it might be. And, and with Georgia's, again, we knew it was going to be a struggle, but I'm very intrigued to see how those teams match up down at Foley Field. Yeah, I think that'll be an interesting series as well. And you look at Georgia. I mean, they're they're in the middle of Mississippi State and Vanderbilt, the top three teams in the league in ERA. Mississippi State at 224, Georgia 2.35, and Vanderbilt 2.42. Uh, they have pitched tremendously well this year. I mean, they they had back-to-back shutouts against Lipscomb last weekend. Took a shutout to the ninth inning. They came within, I think this there was one out in the ninth when Lipscomb scored. So they were two outs away Sunday from three straight shutouts and, and they've gotten good. Uh, they've gotten good starting pitching. Their starters last weekend went 16 scoreless innings and they home runs. Uh, Connor Tate has been a real force for them, you know, on offense and, and, and Georgia has played really well. And, and Tennessee has, uh, you know, swept every non-conference series except the Indiana state series, which included a, a, a huge opening series sweep at Georgia Southern. And uh, they've, they came in tied for the most wins in the SEC uh, and uh, has the most wins of any team in the East and they played really well. I think the one game, you know, they lost two games to Indiana State, but then they had a midweek game at Charlotte two weeks ago and lost nine to nothing. They're probably scratching their head about that, you know, what happened in that game. But, uh, you know, they've got some production in the lineup. And, you know, Liam Spence is a leadoff hitter at 375. Jake Rucker, Drew Gilbert. You know, big home run guys. Uh, Rucker had a two home run game uh, this week. Gilbert's had a two home run game this week. Uh, so both of those guys have played uh, 
have played really well for them. So I think it'll be an interesting series in Athens between two SEC Eastern Division teams that are trying to get to that third and maybe fourth spot behind Vanderbilt, Florida, and South Carolina. Well, here's another interesting thing about Georgia, too, is they haven't exactly been all hands on deck. Jonathan Cannon, their best pitcher, a kid who is a potential first rounder, hasn't thrown but six innings this year, and they've done fine without him. And Ryan Webb, well, I guess Webb's back now. He's thrown 12 and two-thirds, but he missed some time. So the Bulldogs have done it without maybe their best two starting arms coming into the season. In fact, I think they were their best two starting arms. They have had a lot of success without those guys, and I think being able to build that depth lends itself to really good things once you get into the SEC and the NCAA tournament play. Well, I think you have to have that depth. I think Vanderbilt and Mississippi State are showing that with – whether they've combined to use 34, 35 pitchers this year. So I think that's been a good thing for Georgia. You know, the, you know, they're, you know, they, they're not afraid to use four guys in a game. I think one of the shutouts last week was a four man shutout. And uh, I, I don't think they're, you know, I don't think they're afraid to do that. I think they feel like they have a lot of depth and you mentioned injuries in the pitching staff. They've also started four different shortstops this year because of injuries and they've batted him batted those guys up and down the lineup. So they, they've battled injuries. They've had a lot of issues, you know, injury-wise off the field, but they've maintained that 13-3 and three record and that, you know, sparkling ERA as a pitching staff. And, yeah, you know, to me, that's the team that, that no one's talking about in the SEC. And I mentioned Connor Tate a minute ago. He's third in the league in hitting at 410, and he's got a 557 slugging and a 463 on base percentage. But Georgia, to me – that's kind of one of the teams that everybody just kind of overlooks. And I think they've had a really nice start. Now we'll see how they can do when they open up against uh, Tennessee this weekend in Athens. And uh, opening weekends have not been kind to Tennessee in the past. They have uh, they've not won their opening SEC series since 2014, and they've lost 10 out of their last 12, while Georgia's won their last two opening series. So we'll see how – Tennessee can can maybe get on the road and, and see if they can rebound a little bit with not good success on opening weekend in the last, you know, 12 years. Well, this is one of these, I think I'm just going to take whoever the home team is. And that's, in this case, it's Georgia. What do you think on this one? Yeah, I, I, I have Georgia winning the series. Um, I, I just think with them being at home, uh, they've played really well at home. You know, they, they find ways to win. They have four walk-off wins. Uh, this year and they, and they hit home runs. And I think, you know, I think that's something that, you know, plays well for them in that ballpark. Uh, you know, the home run ball is a, you know, is a big part of their offense and, and the ball, even though it's a big part, the ball still I always thought carried, you know, fairly well, you know, in that park and Tennessee, Tennessee's pitching staff has given up 17 home runs this year, uh, a league high, uh, and, you know, Georgia has 19 and, you know, a lot of guys capable of hitting the ball out of the park. So if there's something to watch in that series, Georgia produces a lot of runs with a long ball and, you know, Tennessee is very vulnerable to that. Mississippi State going to LSU. I think it's an interesting series, but I don't know if it's going to be as interesting as I thought it would be before the season. Now, in terms of matchups, it's fascinating because LSU's really got some power in that lineup. And, of course, State's pitching in depth. We have talked about, but I I think if LSU can get a win in the series, which I think is I'm not going to say difficult there at home, right? But I, I really tend to favor Mississippi State heading into Baton Rouge, given where both pitching staffs are right now. Yeah, you look at Mississippi State, you know, second in the league in strikeouts and leads the league in ERA and, you know, tied with A&M for, with four shutouts and, you know, lights out pitching 16, 17 guys deep. And uh, you just kind of look at them and you go, well, they're going to be no match on the mound for LSU. And you look at an LSU team that's, you know, got the second worst ERA in the league and a bullpen that, what, last weekend gave up 18 runs. And they have a, they gave up 14 runs in a game to Oral Roberts where Jaden Hill didn't, uh, you know, didn't pitch well in the first, didn't get out of the first inning. And then the bullpen came on and added on 14 runs to that. So you look at LSU and you're looking like, well, their their pitching is, is is not where it used to be. Mississippi State just 
just hitting 278 as a team. They find ways to win. Their pitching keeps them in the game. They have a lot of low scoring games, a lot of, a lot of games where they've scored, you know, five runs or less, you know, trying to get there. And LSU, the most prolific home run hitting team in this league at 35 home runs. And, you know, they kind of found some magic last weekend. I know against you, it was against UTSA, but, you know, they had two walk-off wins on Saturday and Sunday against UTSA. They have four walk-off wins for the year. You know, they have Cade Doty, who's second to Wes Clark in the league in home runs with eight. Uh, he's homered in four straight games, and all eight of his homers have come in the last nine games. So uh, I, I do think that's a this is an early season, you know, ma- really solid matchup. I wish it was later in the year, you know, where both teams could be, you know, in stride in conference play. But you, know, you got to play – somebody the first week. So they set it up where LSU and Mississippi state, you know, play, you know, the opening weekend of the season. My, my, my gut tells me to take Mississippi state in the series. And, and I, and I want to take LSU as well. Something tells me that LSU is going to play, play well this weekend. Uh, there's something about Cade Doty. There's something in that lineup. Uh, you know, you, you, you just, you, you wonder if they if they could get something going this weekend against Mississippi state, you know, a team that's, you know, played really, really, really well over the years and, and certainly this year. And, but, but it's just, I think it's just going to be hard to pick against Mississippi state just because of their pitching. Well, LSU, they're going to have to get other guys step up. Okay. Landon more. So we haven't really talked about him a lot. Just, because there's so many other pitchers, but this kid's been dominant. He's not given up an earned run in 23 innings. Uh, one extra base hit off the kid all year, 32 strikeouts, three walks. He's been good. A.J. Labas has been fairly good as well. Um, 27 strikeouts, three walks, 310 ERA. Jaden Hill has been where the issue has been a little bit. He's not dominated the way we thought. He had that disastrous outing against Oral Roberts. Um, and, and then on top of that, you know, the bullpen has just been awful, as we've written about a little bit. But Mississippi State, there's one little storyline for them, too. Eric Sarantola has not been good. They're working Bedner back into a position where we both talked this week off podcast. We think it sure looks like they're working him back into the starting rotation. So what are you watching in terms of starting pitching with these two teams this weekend? Because that's a, that's a lot of names I just threw at you. Well, I think – AJ Labus and Marceau have both been really good and both had leads, you know, when they left the game Saturday and Sunday and that bullpen just couldn't hold, just couldn't hold on. You know, Marceau hadn't walked a batter till last Saturday and he walked three in the game against UTSA. Uh, he's been their best guy. Labus has been probably the next best. And, and, he, and then Hill, you know, bounced back after the terrible start against, Oral Roberts, he bounced back and gave him five and two thirds, you know, really scoreless innings, you know, in his next outing. Their their starting pitching has been, has not been, with Hill not pitching the way he you, you would expect him to pitch, has been good. It could it could be a little bit better, but Marceau has really taken the bull by the horns there and 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 pitched extremely well for them. As you said, no earned runs. He just walked his first hitter in his fourth start last week and. But it has been the bullpen has been a problem. Hilliard has been a problem. Getting to the back end of the game and closing the games out has been a real problem for them. Uh, Sarantola has been the Saturday guy the first time. I think he threw four innings on Tuesday night, pitched extremely well. So I'll be interested to see if he moves into that Saturday role this weekend against LSU in, in Baton Rouge um, and just kind of see how things go from there. I will throw this out there. Uh, LSU has beaten Mississippi State each of the last three series and 12 of the last 13 for the history buffs out there. So the Tigers have had their way with the Bulldogs, uh, particularly here in the last 13 years. That's crazy. Uh, what was this, that 12 of 13? They won 12 of 13, yes. And that and I think that includes a super regional where State went to Baton Rouge in a super regional a couple of years ago and, and were swept in a, in a super regional for LSU going to Omaha, you know. Good luck taking on LSU unless you're Stony Brook in, in Alec Box Stadium with Omaha on the line. Best, best of right. luck to you on that one. 
<laughs> so are, are, are you are you throwing a curveball on going LSU, or are you going to stick you, with State here? You know, I actually, last night when my wife and I ran through these, I picked LSU last night, and I think I'm going to stick with LSU. I, I, I really do. I, I, I'm just something – there's something about the home runs. There's something about Doty. There's just something out there that, that, that just – I just it, I call it a gut feeling, and and for me that's a big deal because uh, I I just there's just something about LSU this weekend. I I don't know what it is, but it, you know maybe wrong, they may get swept, but that's the fun in picking where somebody can go, hey, you're an idiot. They swept Mississippi State, swept them. Hey, we're good. You know, I, I don't I, I mean I I like all our teams, but but I just something about LSU this weekend just just makes me want to makes me want to put my check mark on the purpley gold tigers. Okay, I will be attending South Carolina and Vandy a couple of games this weekend in person. Boy, I, I liked the interest in this matchup a lot more two weeks ago. Carolina really struggling to hit the ball, didn't hit the ball particularly well against Mercer, really struggled offensively when it got swept at Texas, dropped the midweek game to Davidson 9-4 to last night. Uh, you know, we always thought that with Carolina, it would be built on offense and the pitching we weren't sure about. I don't think there's a team other than maybe Mississippi State that, that you'd less rather play, and especially in somebody else's park, than Vanderbilt right now. Uh, the way the Commodores are pitching, Vandy just red hot, and it's doing it without Dominic Keegan, who's one of the better hitters in the country and their best hitter. I, I don't know if he's going to play this weekend, but they didn't really miss him last week, and they scored 29 at Oklahoma State in three games after OSU had given up 22 runs in 11 games for the year coming in. Um, Commodores are really hitting the ball. And, of course, Rocker and Leiter have given up one run between them. Uh, and, oh, by the way, they got a pretty decent bullpen, too. I don't know if it's Mississippi State, but it's it's outstanding. Uh, this is just a, a case of, of really two teams heading in very opposite directions. Now, having said that, Carolina has come to Nashville and played pretty well but I don't think I like this matchup for the Gamecocks. I don't think Vandy is who you want to be playing right now as you're trying to get your offensive confidence back. No, I don't think you want to have a four-game losing streak and go, okay, we'll get well Friday night. And, oh, it's Kumar Rocker. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's a uh, – and then it's Jack Leiter the next day. I, I just don't think that's a good combination, a good recipe for success for the Gamecocks who you mentioned have had some success. They have won four of their last five series in Nashville uh, and seven of 11 overall against Vanderbilt. But it, 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 this is not this is not the same. Uh, I think it's an offense that's really struggled. They struggled to score. Well, they scored one run in the first two games at Texas. They struggled to score runs against Mercer. Uh, Wes Clark, who started out with, uh, was it, eight home runs in the first six games of the year. He's hit one home run since February the 28th uh, against Clemson. He has only hit one since then. That was an, oh, by the way, home run at Texas last Saturday or last Sunday in a game that was out of hand at the time, made it eight to four. But uh, I, yeah, I just, I, I can't see the Gamecocks getting well this weekend. Um, I just don't see that at, at Vanderbilt. They have struggled in the SEC, starting in the SEC each of the last two seasons, too. They're, they've lost their last two opening series, and they're one in five in those games. And that's kind of set them on the, you know, on the spiral downward for the year, you know, in, in getting in the tournament. But I, I, I just can't see the Gamecocks getting well in Nashville this weekend at all. You know, another team that's struggling a little bit, Ole Miss has suddenly hit a little bit of a rough patch, gets clobbered at Louisiana Tech 13-1 to in midweek and loses 8-3 to ULM in Oxford after beating ULM by a run the day before. Uh, Auburn has, has struggled, too. I mean, it put up some big offensive numbers early against some bad opposition, uh, but, but the Tigers have had some issues lately. They've also had a lot of games canceled. You know, they had the epic blown lead against Boston College. Um, got right a little bit last weekend with three in a row, actually two out of three against Little Rock, beating UAB right before that. Got a midweek win at Lipscomb this week in a 9-7 ball game. How are we feeling about both those teams heading into that series in Oxford this weekend? Well, it certainly is interesting, uh, kind of two teams – kind of mirrors of each other a little bit. Um, they've had some, they've had some starting pitching issues and they have had some, uh, some bullpen issues. Uh, 
you know, Ole Miss bullpen and the losses to UCF and the loss to Monroe and and to Tech the other night, the bullpen, you know, was kind of kind of beat up a little bit. Uh, their Sunday starter, Derek Diamond, is only one and two with a 5.21 ERA. Uh, they were without Doug McKenzie last weekend with a, a strained muscle in his chest. He's one and one with a 3.15 ERA in his three starts. Uh, well, they, they do think they will get him back this weekend. They think he'll be back. One thing that has helped them is the return of their second baseman and leadoff hitter, Peyton Chattinger. Um, he missed 10 games with a hamstring injury, but in the six games he's played, he's hitting 435 with with five doubles and three ribbies. Um, Broadway has been decent out of the pen for them. Uh, Elko, the third baseman, Tim Elko, has been on fire, one of the hottest hitters in the league, uh, hitting 532 during his current hitting streak. He has seven home runs. So, whoa. If they're if they can get Nikhazy back and they can straighten Diamond out on Sundays, because uh, Hogland has been really good on Saturday all year long uh, for them. Auburn's kind of a mirror image of them. That you know they scored 55 runs in two games against Alabama A&M. They've only scored 94 runs in the other 13 games. Auburn's got to kind of get their pitching staff figured out as well. They have started in the non-conference four different rotations. Uh, they moved their closer, Cody Greenhill, to the number one spot. He's missed a week with an injury. Uh, Richard Fitz did not pitch last week after allowing five home runs in his previous two starts. Uh, senior left-hander Jack Owen has still yet to take the mound. He's battled it, issues and injuries throughout his career. But, the you know, the bullpen, you know, against Boston College and, and, and Little Rock the last two Sundays, and just on the two Sunday games, have given up 11 runs in the ninth inning. And they, uh, to me, uh, I think we talked about this off off podcast. But to me, if, if they could get Owen and Fitz uh, and Bright, the freshman on Sunday, who's pitched fairly well, he didn't have a great outing last Sunday, but he's pitched well the rest of the year. They kind of work those three guys in and maybe get Green Hill back in the pen, uh, where he is more probably more comfortable as a closer. That would probably help them a little bit. Richard Fitz threw pretty good at at uh, Lipscomb. Uh, Tuesday night, he did throw two scoreless innings, uh, more uh, more strikes and balls. Uh, did walk a couple, but he struck out three. But he gave them two pretty good innings in relief. Uh, I don't know if that's something that they're looking at. Maybe run him out of the bullpen. But to me, you look at a guy. You, you, you know, you're going to run a guy out of the pen. You know, it's giving up. You know, has a propensity to give up that long ball. Can't can't have a reliever come in and give up a three run homer in the eighth inning. Not in this league, uh, so so that would be something that would be a concern for me. Yeah, I didn't think Auburn had the margin for error with its pitching that a lot of other teams did. I was concerned that Greenhill might not have the stamina to start. Um, it, so far, it looks like there's maybe something to that. I, I just think he's more suited for a relief role. And the thing was, they had to have Fitz come through for them. He was a kid who was getting some mid-first-round buzz before the season. It's just not gone well at all. Uh, you mentioned Jack Owen. That's a guy they've got to get back. I just don't think the Tigers have got enough pitching uh, to go into Ole Miss, even with the Rebels a little bit wobbly and, and giving up some home runs at times. Uh, that's just a, such a solid team both ways. Offensively, so many guys back on that team. Um, and, and even with the, the pitching issues, like you said, the injuries and things like that. I just think Ole Miss has still got so many arms left that when you start matching them up with Auburn, I, I think it, it tilts pretty heavily in the Rebels' favor. Yeah, I agree. I think I think one through three starters, and then your and then your four through eight or nine bullpen, and your closer. I think Ole Miss has more, probably a little more depth there. It probably has the advantage there. You know, I think probably uh, Ole Miss has a little bit more firepower in their offense than Auburn does, although Bliss and Woley and Moore and Stephen Williams, you know, all veteran players and, you know, can hit the long ball. I think Ole Miss may have a little bit more firepower. I also think they've opened the park up a little bit more too. And and uh, I think they had like 6,000 at a game last weekend with ULM. So I think I, that, that to me is a factor, you know, in, in going where you're used to playing in front of 800 or 1200 at Auburn and, you know, maybe a couple of hundred at Lipscomb this the other night. Uh, you know, going to Oxford and playing in front of seven or eight thousand, and the uh, you know the red solo cups in right field. That's a that's a 
to me, that's a big difference. And I, I would give Ole Miss the advantage in, in all the things this weekend and, and winning the series with Auburn. Yeah, I'm with you, too. I, I would have a hard time seeing Auburn going into Oxford and winning the series here. Um, boy, speaking of tough spots, Alabama has played so well at times, uh, but the, the one guy you didn't want to lose is Connor Pruitt. I still don't know that we know about him. Um, and Arkansas, not a place you want to go to right now either, uh, especially with, with your ace, I, I guess, out again this weekend. Size that one up for us, please, Barry. Yeah, Prelip is out again, and and Brad Bohannon said the other day at least a couple of more weeks, so which means to me that he's probably not going to be available for Ole Miss next week and Tennessee the next. And now you've missed six weeks, and it's probably going to take you another week or two to get back into the mix. If he gets back into the mix at all, I don't I don't know anything extra there other than what Brad said the other day that he's going to be out a couple more weeks, but. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they have to have him on Friday night to have any kind of chance, you know, to, to, to get a game or two games in a series. And, and I, I don't know that they can, that they can get a series against any SEC team without him on the mound. Uh, you know, Ross has pitched pretty well. Uh, Dylan Smith has probably been the best guy the last couple of weeks. Antoine John has pitched okay. Didn't have a great game last Sunday against Stetson. Um, but I don't I don't know that Arkansas is the place you'd want to go the first weekend of the season to try to see what can happen, you know, with your team. You know, everybody, everybody's, ex- from Alabama's standpoint, you know, he thinks he has a good team. He thought he had a good team last year. You know, they've played really well. They won, what are they, 30 and four the last two years. They haven't played an SEC team. And, and now we're now we're finally going to get a chance to what do you look like against an SEC team? And unfortunately for them, they're going to Arkansas without Connor Prelip, and they're going to play an Arkansas team that's mad because they got shut out against uh, La Tech on Sunday, and they were carved up pretty good by Carmichael and Oklahoma on Tuesday, both lefties, and Prelip would have been a lefty, and that might have carried over a little bit more and frustrating Arkansas a little bit. Um, and and just kind of seeing how they are. But I, I think Arkansas is too much for them at, at home this weekend. Uh, I, even with prelip, I don't know that Alabama could win the series, uh, but Arkansas has hit a lot of home runs. They have opened up their part. Uh, they had a huge crowd Tuesday night against Oklahoma, and they are right now the consensus number one team in the country, and I think they will play like that this weekend when Alabama comes to town. We talked about Kentucky before the season as a team that I thought had some potential because of some bats like Rhodes and Colette. And Kentucky thought the pitching was going to be better, and so far it has been. Um, although, again, not, not the toughest of schedules, right? And we've seen Kentucky do this before early in the year where they play pretty well and they hit the season. I think Kentucky gets a gift to start the season. Missouri's the only bad team in the league. Uh, Tigers pitching has just been pretty bad. And I think if you're Kentucky, you've gotten off to a good 11-3 and three start. Looks like a decent ball club. You see a team or two every year that just starts with some confidence. This used to happen to Tennessee a lot, right? The Vols would run off a 13-2 you know, a, a out of conference and then get to the SEC and just get destroyed. And then I think confidence had to be part of it there with the Vols. Kentucky, to me, is kind of in that spot where Tennessee had been in, in several years recently where they, they get that good start. We've seen the Wildcats do that before. Again, Kentucky rarely plays a challenging pre-conference schedule, but a lot of it's confidence. And I, I think there's no better way to build confidence than maybe getting Missouri in your park. This is a series that Kentucky, I think, has got a chance to sweep. Uh, then it goes to Auburn next weekend. We've talked about the Tigers struggling. I like the way the schedule sets up for Kentucky to start the year to really help the Wildcats maybe build in some margin um, and, and grow in confidence where I think maybe they could sneak in as a regional team by the end of the year. Well, I, Kentucky, as you mentioned, 11-3, and three and, and, and obviously the best situation for them, you know, not a tough non-conference schedule. and boom, they draw Missouri right out of the gate. The worst offensive team and the worst pitching staff ERA-wise in the league by almost, well, it is three runs, 3.2 runs a game worse than LSU. 
Their ERA is 724. LSU's is 4.02. Missouri's given up 128 runs, the most of any team in the league. The next closest team is LSU, and they've given up 84. Uh, and you look at Kentucky, they've played 14 games. They've played the fewest number of games in the league with along with Arkansas, and they have the fewest runs scored at 93. But I think confidence is a big thing for them. They're, they're 11 and three. They, they've played some games they, that they lost. They probably should have won. They got hammered Tuesday night at home by Murray State. They hit five home runs in the game Tuesday night and, and, and still weren't competitive. They still lost 13 to eight. Um, you know, Collette uh, and those guys and Rhodes you mentioned and Schultz, you know, good offensive team. Uh, looks like they've hit 18 home runs. They're third in the league in hitting. They're fourth in the league in ERA, uh, and so they've and they and they lead the league with six saves, and they've only given up six home runs, which is the fewest number of home runs of any team in the league. I, I don't know that they'll have any trouble with Missouri at all, who struggles to score. Although Missouri had a huge weekend last week against uh, uh, Illinois State, uh, scored double digits in all the games that they had won that they won in that series, but. You know, they have not done that very often this year. They have really struggled to score runs, and they've struggled to get people out. And I think confidence is a big thing for Kentucky at 11-3, and three, and they're looking at Missouri coming in, and they look at the numbers and go, you know, we got to get to 14-3. and three, and, and I don't know that they got a chance. All right, Barry, any parting thoughts uh, before we end the baseball portion of our podcast today? I just, you know, opening weekend and – you know, all the teams, you know, O and O to get started. I you know, just real excited about watching A and M in Florida tonight and you know, LSU and Mississippi State. I think there's some, you know, some really interesting matchups. Uh, you know, the uh, Florida uh A and M's the only non, you know, divisional matchup. It's a West versus East. Everybody else is playing within the division. I just just kind of just check on all the games we looked that we talked about and you know, can uh you know, can these pitchers put up these numbers they've put up in the non-conference against these SEC type hitters? I mean, can they get, you know, can Mississippi State get LSU out? Can they keep the ball in the park? You know, how will Arkansas respond after two losses? You know, where's Florida uh, th- at this point in the year, you know, scuffling a little bit with five losses and the, and the red hot Aggies coming to town. So just a lot of intriguing matchups and a lot of excitement and, you know, I think we'll learn a little bit more about all 14 of our teams, you know, come Sunday night when the, when the series have all concluded. Yeah. I think the thing that's going to be fun about this year, Barry, you say intriguing matchups. I think we're literally going to say that every weekend because there's so many good and elite teams in this league that it doesn't really matter how you, you shake it up. I think maybe, and I hate to pick on Missouri here. I think unless Missouri is involved, um, I, I think it's going to be hard pressed for most series not to be, somewhat interesting this year. And I, I think you're going to have a lot of weekends, three or four that, that you just, you'd love to be able to watch start to finish, but you got to, you got to pick and choose because you can't watch everybody at once. And uh, that just gets me really excited for SEC baseball, because I think when I'm watching a series, my eyes going to be on my phone, checking scores, a lot of places. I just think the product this year and the storylines and the races are going to be as compelling as we've ever seen. And that's a pretty high bar to clear when you're talking about Southeastern Conference baseball. Yeah, I agree. I, I could I could see going down to the last Saturday of the year and not knowing who's going to win the East, not knowing who's going to win the West, not knowing who's going to be the overall champion, and not knowing which 12 teams are going to Hoover. I think it could be uh, maybe minus Missouri. I think all 13 teams could still be in the hunt for, for Hoover. I think all 13 teams could still be in somewhat consideration for the NCAA tournament. And I think as many as five or six teams, you know, could still be in line to win the SEC championship, maybe even on the last day of the season. I think it's that good. I think what one year, several years ago, Florida, Vanderbilt, South Carolina, all tied for first in the East at 20 and 10. And, you know, one of those teams ended up being the fourth seed in the SEC tournament because the the West champion got to be, the, I think, the second seed the way it worked out. And, you know, the other two guys were third and fourth. They still got double buys. But you're still like, well, wow, that's, uh, you know, your SEC champion is the fourth seed. And that, that could happen this year. I mean, it really could. 
Well, we're going to debut baseball power rankings at the site. We're doing this Thursday. We'll have this up later today. Uh, that was been a that's been a fun and excruciatingly tough exercise for you to walk through. I know there was some gnashing of teeth, maybe some weeping involved. I don't know for sure, but uh, that's going to be a thing we're going to roll out every week now that we've got some more baseball in front of us. And Barry, you'll be back with us next week. We, of course, will talk about what went on this weekend and talk about what's ahead. And just so excited baseball was here. I guess if I had my preference, I'd like to put it off one more weekend because we got such a great weekend of basketball, too, and you can only watch so much. But but either way, lots to be thankful and excited about. Uh, we, we've gone from nothing for a year to our cup overfloweth uh, here as we head into the weekend, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I think I said uh, the other day, uh, doing an interview on a radio show, I, I don't remember the last time I was as excited to watch the selection show on CBS uh, I mean, it's fun every year to watch it, but, you know, you knew this year that it was real. Uh, I was at the Shelton State Marion Military Institute Junior College Baseball game last year when I saw on my phone through a text, through a tweet, that uh, the NCAA men's and women's basketball tournament and the College World Series had been canceled. And, and it made me sick. I mean, I was sad. And uh, it, it it, it took away a lot. I mean, I know there are a lot of things that are, you know, more important out there than 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 sports and college sports and winning and losing. Uh, but we didn't know a whole lot about what we were dealing with at the time. We certainly do now. But uh, it, it it was a loss for a lot of people. It took the livelihoods away from a lot of us, and it took the game away from a lot of kids. Uh, a lot of those kids who, if they didn't have college basketball or baseball or track or whatever, probably wouldn't be in college. And, uh, you know, it is a big deal to those kids. And they, they do excel at that. And some of them, you know, leave and go be great professionals. And some leave early and, you know, make a lot of money. And it's a big deal to them. And it was a, it was a loss and it was a void. And I'm glad we're back. I'm glad we have SEC baseball. I'm glad we have the NCAA tournament, the NIT, the CBI, the women's NCAA, the women's NIT, and spring training baseball. It's all crazy, and it's all fun to watch. And, uh, you know, this is a great weekend with, you know, lots of events going on starting with the first four tonight. It's going to be, you know, A&M in Florida, and the first four tonight uh, going to be a lot of fun. All right, uh, Blake. We're gonna throw it back to you if you're still awake over here. <laughs> yeah, I've just been just been listening to the knowledge. That's uh, that's what I do when you guys uh, talk baseball. But no, I as you said, I mean it's there's so much going on right now. I've I've certainly had my head uh, deep into to basketball and trying to break down all these matchups uh, in the SEC and elsewhere. And uh, yeah, so there's there's lots happening right now. Uh, but uh, as you guys talked about, we got a lot of great stuff. Over on the website, uh, southeastern14.com, uh, you'll have the baseball power rankings. We'll obviously have coverage uh, of the NCAA tournament. And as we sort of teased earlier, we'll make some picks uh, for the tournament probably uh, tomorrow on the podcast. So, yeah, a lot, lot's happening for sure. Well, and just for people wondering who maybe just listen to podcasts, Blake, you usually are a basketball guy. Barry's usually our baseball guy, and I, I chip in on both. But you follow baseball a lot, too. So as soon as basketball's <laughs> over, you're going to be locked in with this with us, too. There's only so much time right. in the day, and, and you're doing a killer job of following what's going on with, with basketball. But you're going to you're going to be helping us out on baseball too. And I know you were very excited about that as well. Cause you love college baseball. Yeah. Like you said, there's just only so much time you can uh, be able to, to break down everything. And of course, uh, you know, doing all the basketball stuff and we go straight from conference tournament to NCAA tournament. And then, you know, I'm, I'm breaking down stuff uh, on a national level too with, with college basketball. And so it's just, uh, yeah, this is kind of that time of year where I'm kind of like you guys. I wish sometimes uh, maybe just push it back a week or two and that would uh, really help be able to kind of, uh, be able to go through everything at once but uh, right now there's just man there's a lot happening but it, it's good because as we said last time this year or this year uh, last time uh, it's just like boy we, we didn't have that so well uh for blake lovell and barry allen i'm your host chris lee be sure and check in with us again at the website every day southeastern14.com as we upload uh, excuse me as we update our online content follow us on twitter at 14southeastern.com. We've got a bracket challenge up there. So join in for fun and let's see who's got the best picks. 
course, rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. You can get that at Apple Podcasts or most places you get your podcasts. And check back with us again on Friday. I think Blake and I are going to have a final look at the NCAA tournament field, catch you up on whatever news transpires in the next 24 hours. But anyway, thank you for listening to us here at the 14. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We will catch up with you again on Friday. 